So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. All right, so what I want to do now is to take with you John W. Dorley's experience of discovery, the discovery of the idea of the science and system of Christian science and show you that it was another instance of pattern across scale. You know that um, John Dorley really discovered what? The discovery of Mrs. Eddy's, Mrs. Eddy's own discovery that she had set forth in the Christian Science textbook. You know that she said that divine metaphysics is reduced to a system to a form that is comprehensible by, adapted to the age in which we live, that it's reduced to a system, that it is understandable to the age in which we live. And um, so he asked himself, well, what is this system? What is the system of science? And he uh, arrived in Boston in 1910, uh, right at the time of Mrs. Eddy's departure. And we know that already by the year 1914, he was deeply involved in investigating the days of creation. From 1914 until the 1930s, the early 1930s, he was especially concerned with the developing concept of order. And as I said, in 1914, he began to investigate the days of creation. And it occurred to him for the very first time in 1914 that those days may in fact occur in a logical unfoldment. He took those days of creation every day after for the rest of his life, turning to them, going over them, nurturing them, loving them. You see that he had really taken up the timeless scale uh, of the pattern. And in 1916, he began to give lectures for the Mother Church on the definitive sequence of the days of creation. You have to remember at this time, he had not associated these days with the word order. We're taking the development right from the, right from the beginning, right from the ground up. The inductive way, the inductive method of science to see how that way leads. And so he only saw the days and he only saw there must be some logical order in them and he loved that sense of order and he began to give lectures on it for the Mother Church as a definitive sequence. But he hadn't defined, really, that definitive sequence. He hadn't defined it fully. In the early 20s, he found another seven-fold order of spiritual ideas. In other words, he found a second scale, another scale, right? A sevenfold order of values, 
And we know that as the third degree in the two translations on page 115 and 116 of the Christian Science textbook. So it was that order of understanding, the third degree, that scale that reads wisdom, purity, spiritual understanding, spiritual power, love, health, and holiness. Really showing how mortal mind disappears and man in God's image appears. And he felt that there was some kind of a law of unfoldment, again, in that order. Just think of that. A whole six years go by, you don't see another scale. You don't, you don't come on another scale. You have only one scale. You can't really form a hypothesis because you have only one particular, one instance. So six years go by, and suddenly you find there's another scale. And it seems to have something in common with the first one. This could already become evidence for a hypothesis. But John Dorley was a spiritual scientist with pure intuition, and he never let anything of a human nature come into that pure intuition. And so he didn't ever jump the gun. He never said what we very often find ourselves saying, I wonder if it could be this way, or uh, let, let's see if these two will fit together. Do they fit? Does it fit? It fits. You know, the, that fit business, of seeing if things fit, do they fit? He, he didn't try to make anything fit. But he felt that there could be one basic law there, that those two scales somehow indicated a law, some kind of a law. So in the early 20s, continuing on, he recognized the same sevenfold order again. This time he recognized it in the commandments. He had gone to the Bible, he was into the Bible again, and he recognized the sevenfold order in the commandments and in the first seven beatitudes. And then in the Lord's Prayer. And it's very interesting that uh, in the manual, I think it's so interesting that Mrs. Eddy says that those three are the three teachings that she wants to be taught in the Christian Science Sunday School, that she wants the children to be taught the Beatitudes, the commandments, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer. And uh, so he now had five, right? Five particular instances, all pointing to a general, to a conclusion. And he became more and more convinced of the order in being. This is the inductive method. And uh, he became more convinced that each one of these orders was presenting steps and stages that unfolded according to a definite law that it wasn't just an order, but it was a law, or that order constituted law. So you have this order, this pattern, and you see it was the pattern recurring in instance after instance. Uh, let me just put this up so you can see what was going on with him. 
This is actually from the study aid, page 47. And you just see there the uh, what we now call examples of the word order. He didn't know it was the word order then. He only felt order. <laughs> and so uh, began, as you see over on the left-hand side, with the, with the days of creation. And then his second insight was actually into the third degree. Then in between the third degree and the, what we have there as the creativity or the Dorley order, you would, uh, you would put the commandments, the Beatitudes, and the Lord's Prayer. And so he was building up scales. Can you see that? That being didn't say to him, all right, here's the pattern. Page 465. Mind, spirit, soul, principle, life, truth, love. No. Being said, here's a scale. Here's what I am. And I'm also this. And I am this. And I'm this. Scale, scale, scale. Scale, scale, see? And so the pattern was not yet revealed, but he had all these scales recurring in instance after instance, which is the building up inductively of the evidence of a fundamental pattern. So he was building up the evidence for, for the discovery of a law, for the discovery of the pattern. Then from 1923 onwards, he had a constantly growing concern for understanding more deeply the seven synonymous terms for God. That came in at this point. Nine years after the first occurrence of the days of creation in his consciousness, that the days of creation may be in order, may have an order. Nine years later, it began to impress itself on him that he must look into the seven synonymous terms for God as given in recapitulation. So that became the main theme for uh, all of his classes and association meetings at that time. And in 1926, for the very first time, the seven synonymous terms became the subject of a lecture that he gave uh, as lecture for the Mother Church. By 1929, he felt that he must resign as lecture in order to devote himself to the deeper research of the pure science of Christian science. So that brings us up to the 1930s. You can see that he had not yet uh, formulated that law. He wasn't sure what those different scales had in common, what their common denominator was. He only felt there was a common denominator. And in the 1930s, his focus then shifted to the question of scientific system. Scientific system. In 1936 then, you see another, uh, let's see, when, uh, gosh, how long was that? What did we say when he was finding in the early 20s, you see, the uh, commandments, the Beatitudes, and the Lord's Prayer. 16, almost 16 years later, he found the next scale. Imagine, 16 years go by and you suddenly find the next scale, and that was the scale of the scientific tools. Because he was so focused on the sense of scientific system and what that system was and was investigating all of the scientific terminology within the textbook, he came upon these various tools that Mrs. Eddy would speak about. And she would speak about law. 
and order and rule and system and method and form and plan and design. And so he sensed out somehow the order of those tools, that they could be in an order. And so he had the sixth instance of a scale or an order, six particulars from which he could have drawn his uh, conclusion, his hypothesis. In 1936, between 1936 and 37, then uh, right about that same time, he kept on returning to the Genesis chapter in the textbook with the spiritual conviction that behind the symbols of the seven days, you see he was being drawn back to the seven days, but now within the textbook presentation of, the, uh, uh, of Genesis, he was feeling that there might be a sevenfold fundamental law of creation. And in 1937, he then formulated the law for himself. So we have what we call uh, the creativity order, or John Dorley's uh, creativity order, because he took those seven days and, and gave to them uh, the following values. The creative ability of, of the first day, I almost said mind, but he didn't know mind at that point, you see. Creative ability, then unfoldment coming out of the creative ability, then out of the unfoldment of the creative ability comes identity. That identity has classification, definite classification. It also has individuality and consciousness and unity with God. So as he went through those seven days, he would characterize each of them with those seven ideas. And um, all right, so we were uh, seeing that development with John W. Dorley. Uh, and in that uh, discovery of the science of Christian science, he had now reached the, uh, the discovery of the seventh scale. You remember that uh, we were seeing what those scales were that he uh, found on his way through those many years, starting back in 1914, at which time he had taken up the days of creation and was living with those days of creation uh, day after day, year after year. And after uh, a number of years, he found uh, another order, an order not in the Bible, but in the textbook, in the uh, second translation, or we could say in the uh, translation, the Christ translation on page 115 and 116 of the textbook. You're familiar with the um, uh, third degree, that degree of understanding. And you know that there is a sevenfold order given uh, at that point in the text. And so he felt that this order had something to do with the days of creation. He wasn't sure what, but he felt that they were both indicating some kind of a, a logical unfoldment and that they may, uh, in fact, have a law behind them. Then some further years went on, and he had been working in the Bible. You know that he was back and forth between the Bible and the textbook constantly. And in uh, working in the Bible, um, 
with uh, the commandments, he found that there seemed to be a sevenfold order in the commandments. Then going to the Sermon on the Mount, he discovered that there was another sevenfold development in the first seven Beatitudes and also in the Lord's Prayer. A number of years went by and he had been uh, redirected in his uh, endeavors toward um, finding the scientific system of Christian science in the textbook and in uh, investigating all of the scientific terminology he came to the uh, seven scientific tools, or he felt that he could uh, discern in the text seven pronounced tools for the scientist, which Mrs. Eddy had uh, set forth as necessary in order to uh, be a scientist. He then had returned to uh, the days of creation again and was looking at them and felt that he could epitomize that uh, order of the days of creation with uh, terms of his own, and that was the creativity order that I think we took just uh, prior to the uh, break this morning. So all of this was leading him uh, leading him to the, really the, the great question, the right question, a question now that could not be denied any longer, and that is, do these orders have anything to do with the sevenfold definition of God? And so uh, the great question was stated, and the implications of that question were enormous because it meant that to answer that question was to undertake an absolutely thorough investigation of the seven synonymous terms in the Christian Science textbook. So this question was absolutely uh, crucial to the whole future of the science of being. It was the um, launching, therefore, of the synonym study. Perhaps you've heard about or read about that synonym study that began in 1938 and 39 and um, uh, involved really the setting forth uh, of the synonymy principle, of what we know today as the synonymy principle. He knew that only by answering this question could his hypothesis, because uh, the question itself really indicated that he had a, a hypothesis, the hypothesis that uh, that the uh, sevenfold definition of God in the seven capitalized terms, as given on page 465, would would perhaps be the underlying deep structure law of all of these instances that he had found in both the Bible and the textbook. And um, so he gathered together a group, I think, of about eight or nine uh, students, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, about nine. And um, uh, they went to recapitulation to begin with that first question and to also take up the second question because you know the second question asks are these terms synonymous and Mrs. Eddy answers yes they are and so in order to do a synonym study they had to be absolutely clear about, first of all, what a synonym is and what it means to be synonymous. And you know that in that answer she says, yes, they are, they all refer to one God, right? And then she says, they are also indicated, they are also uh, intended to express 
the nature, essence, and wholeness of deity. And so she gives a twofold answer. It's that twofold answer that you know that I uh, belabor every chance I get, <laughs> every time we are together, because I feel it is so important for the Christian scientist to understand what is meant by synonymous, the two aspects of synonymous. And this they had to become completely clear about before they could undertake that study. So actually, Mrs. Eddy says, as a first answer, yes, they are synonymous because they all refer to one God. Therefore, what? Mind refers to God. Spirit refers to God. Soul, principle, life, truth, love refer to God. They all refer to God. Therefore, we can say uh, mind is God, spirit is God, soul, principle, life, truth, and love are God. And so we can also say then mind is spirit, mind is soul, mind is principle, mind is life, mind is truth, and mind is love. Yes, this is true. But she then brings in a second aspect of synonymy. And she says they are also, so as though to say, all right, now here's the one side of the coin, the synonymy coin. Now I'm going to tell you the other side of that coin. They are also intended to express the nature, essence, and wholeness of deity. As though to say, they all have something in common. They are all God. But they are all God in a different way. Each one expresses the nature of God, the essence of God, the wholeness of God in a completely unique way. And that must be seen. That uniqueness must be seen. And the, um, the great uh, jumble in the church was that no one saw that. So this question brought John Dorley to the crux of the whole, the whole thing, the crux of the science. Because in the church, they said, everything is interchangeable. All these seven terms, why are you making such a fuss over these seven terms when they are interchangeable? When Mrs. Eddy says, they all refer to God. Hmm? So I can use mind, I can use soul. Uh, it doesn't matter which term she used. She could have used any term. And so the movement really came to a, a I would say, a standstill and remains in that standstill. And what did, didn't we say in this class that you can't stand still. You go backwards if you don't go forward. If you don't go forward. If you don't go more deeply into the science, you go backwards. And so the movement has never, ever looked into the, the depth of that question of the seven synonymous terms. Only John Dorley did that. And um, so, John Dorley and his little uh, band of, of, of nine all together um, was wise enough to take up that study and not to take his own hypothesis too seriously until he had done so. You know, he just think he had all of those scales and he could have uh, drawn the conclusion about the pattern. He could have drawn the conclusion about the word order, but he didn't. He was wise enough not to accept the res results of his inductive method as conclusive without that synonym study, a thorough investigation of the textbook as a whole. He knew that only if he could corroborate 
from the textbook his findings and test his findings against those findings uh, instead of having a, only a personal interpretation that uh, without that he, he would always be under attack, always be under criticism, always be uncertain within himself until he could do that, that study. So from the autumn of 1938 to the spring of 1939, not really very long if you think of it, about six months, uh, he began that synonym analysis, which was exhaustive and detailed and covered 3,342 references to the seven synonymous terms for God, from mind to love. And only when that was done could he then verify the ideas that constitute the various ideational orders that we have been looking at. <clears throat>